Hello, everybody. First of all, my name is Giuseppe, so this is, should be the right presentation, the right way of pronouncing my name. And this should be the first slide, but I changed my mind while I was on the taxi today, and this is the real one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, this should be illegal, okay? Waking up, me, I'm, I'm a light person. Um, uh, and I got two really hard tasks to, to do today. One is quiz all my experience in 20 minutes and probably give you a demo if I have time. And the other one, waking you up. Are you up? No. Yes. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I will try to wake you up. And anyway, if I'm disturbing you, I will go and be, be, be quiet. So who's this guy here talking to you? Um, I'm an OpenStack guy. Um, somebody, I don't like the word, I'm an entrepreneur as well. Even I don't like it, okay, I've got two companies, one of which we do OpenStack Consulting is Alchemy Solutions, is UK based, and uh, the other company is doing uh, GAL, is doing cloud security, and is Swiss based. So I'm actually split between London and Switzerland, and sometimes Milan in Italy, uh, where my wife is. Um, so <laughs> so the, 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 the only question you really are not allowed to ask today is, where do you live? So that's, that's the only one. Uh, yeah, I have a few experience in, uh, in the industry, um, almost 20 years, um, in small companies like uh, Canonical, I guess you know Ubuntu as the name, uh, Red Hat, IBM, Sun Micro. Um, pretty good experience all across Europe. And yes, I was based in Ireland up to a few years ago. Um, but what I would like to talk to you today, um, before I do it, I frequently ask a question. So, before, all my friends, before actually they ask me, how's your wife doing? Um, they come up, how was the OpenStack board doing? Uh, I, was, I was a candidate at the OpenStack board. Who, first of all, who messed it up? Um, who actually tried OpenStack? Oh, a few of them. Okay, great. Um, as you probably know, the OpenStack is a, is a foundation as well. Um, half of the board is made by um, by the contributors and half of the board is made by the sponsors who make the money in it. And the, basically the top eight comes into the board. So unfortunately, so the bad news is that I didn't make it. Uh, the good news is that I was rated number 12. So it's okay, it's not really a win, but still. Part of a community. So um, I visit very much CIOs and the CEOs of many companies. So how do you see the IT today? Um, mm, something like that. Um, well, it's a bit a ninja one, but it's definitely moving. It's moving forward. The thing is, we have, um, uh, we have two speeds in the IT now. Uh, everybody is talking about cloud, and um, they want to have something agile. They want to have time to market, something like yesterday. Um, you didn't do that already. And uh, the other one, uh, oh, we need to have certified workloads. Well, uh, I didn't knew there was a definition until uh, a few months ago when Garner came up with uh, this uh, terminology called dual mode IT or bimodal IT. Uh, what's, what's all about is basically you got two speeds in IT. So it's combining the existing um, traditional workloads with the new workloads. So you ended up having two modes. The first one is, again, is in traditional virtualization solutions, like, you know, probably the most common name is VMware, okay, where traditional load sets. Uh, you have uh, safety, you have your own comfort zone, and basically it's all about uh, certifications. And that's the comfort zone for many of my customers, I do this with really large enterprise customers. And this one is where you would like to have certified workloads. On the other end, you would like to have more agile way of uh, approaching IT, especially when it comes to new web apps or mobile stuff, uh, or even QA, for example, uh, and then comes to uh, the cloudish world. Um, I will talk mainly about OpenStack, but it's not all about OpenStack. You can achieve the same goal with, uh, with other virtualization technology or with other cloud technologies. Could be on Amazon, could be on Azure, uh, could be on anything else. But the, the thing is, come up with speed and try to deploy fast. Uh, probably there will be a 
can I spoil it a bit? <laughs> there will be um, a Docker demo afterwards. Uh, so it's, that comes to, um, to a more agile world. So uh, talking on a real world scenario, uh, this is a story about a customer of mine. Even before actually Gardner came up with the BFI model IT uh, definition, uh, when CIOs come to, to me, basically they want to try and save money from VMware, um, which could be the main reason of switching, but it turns out uh, what they really need is to be quick in deploying. Why? Uh, I'll tell you, a bank here in London takes 120 days to deploy a single VM. Believe it or not, you know, we do that in five minutes or something, but they ended up mapping the same processes uh, they had on bare metal on virtualization. So instead of you know, having somebody on cabling the network, uh, they go and say set an SLA for five days to add a virtual network interface on VMware. So five days plus five days plus five days, you ended up doing one month of waiting for a single VM, which is not possible into uh, a real enterprise today. And of course, this customer is really very, uh, very conservative. They don't want to take away the workload for, from VMware. The, there's a comfort zone, you know, never being fired for uh, IBM or VMware, for example. So they're going for, for that. And the only, the real pain point for them is having a lot of tickets uh, into the IT stuff. So what did they, what did they were doing before, uh, somebody opened up a ticket, uh, can you please create a new virtual machine with blah, blah, blah specification? Or even worse, it's not only the provision, it's, it's the, what they call the change management. So can you please increase the RAM? Can you please increase, add more disks or add more virtual NICs? Uh, and that will take, I mean, a lot of requests for basically nothing. So they want to try and automate all this stuff. And they want to automate every single aspect as much as they can on their own IT. Yeah. Uh, I, all the IT flow. Um, so how do, how can you, you know, combine the two speeds between uh, OpenStack and uh, VMware? So in general, there are a couple of ways of achieving that. The first one is uh, using OpenStack as an orchestrator. Um, you use OpenStack to uh, orchestrate resources on VMware and KVM. Okay, how do you do that? Uh, you actually create what they call in OpenStack two regions, one of which is on KVM, one of which is on VMware. So why doing this approach? Uh, OpenStack, the good of OpenStack is about uh, uh, the choice. The choice of uh, um, what, what's underneath, and the other one is the choice of APIs. So the good thing is that you got a common set of well-defined API to access your service, whatever it's on VMware, KVM, or even Hyper-V if you wish, or whatever storage is underlying. You really don't care. So once you create your package, your deployment uh, script for KVM, you can easily move to VMware, or you can easily move to other virtualization technologies. This is really a good pro. Another way of integrating OpenStack and VMware is using a cloud management portal. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of what a CMP is, uh, it's basically a web interface, okay. Um, can be really complex, okay. The good thing about this is that you, uh, the cloud management portal talks directly to VMware or talks directly to the underlying platform with their own APIs. So the pros of this is that you really don't touch VMware, okay. And the other scenario, Yeah. Build Say that again, please. Or is it something you build yourself? Uh, can, can be both, okay. Uh, you have, um, have pre-made uh, cloud management platforms. Uh, the most common I see on the market is HPS CSA, cloud, uh, cloud service automation. And the other one is uh, ManageIQ uh, from Red Hat. The, so the official commercial name of it is CloudForms. Uh, they are the most, the most popular one, but 
you potentially, so I got another customer that is actually do, doing their own uh, cloud management portal. Um, it's, it's all about knowing the API, you know. It's, there is no single recipe, and to be honest, uh, I haven't seen one customer equal to the other. Okay, so it's, uh, it's very complex. Uh, another cloud management portal that I will see today is Scala, for example. There's another way of integrating it. But there are pros and cons on, on each solution, okay? Um, the, this kind of approach is really good if you, you know, if a sort of uh, not willing to touch the VMware, because on the other one, you need to integrate OpenStack into VMware, which means a bit touching the vCenter, uh, vCenter in VMware. But what, the, what this specific customer decided to go is to go for both. Why? Um, they, they like the idea of integrating OpenStack uh, and uh, having a common set of API. However, they didn't like the standard Horizon interface, so the standard web UI for OpenStack. Okay, it's a nice web interface, okay, but sometimes can be a bit more complex for the end user. So please mind that uh, this customer want to give the portal to the actual end user, deciding deploying who is what and what kind of services they would like. Um, so they ended up doing OpenStack and Scala. So again, what's the pros of uh, Scala? compared to the other. So, um, in this specific scenarios, they decided that um, Scala was less complex to manage than uh, Cloud Forms in Red Hat and HP CSA. Uh, why? It's, uh, you know, this, these two tools are meant for, more for IT people rather than uh, the end, internal end customers. So it's a bit more complex to set up and it's a bit more complex to consume by default. And to be honest, a bit more pricey, okay? <laughs> well, a lot pricey. Um, furthermore, Scala, as um, uh, I wish to see, I have a screenshot later on. Um, uh, you got uh, pre-made templates for everything. So you can select, I want a database, I want a web application server, I want a Redis, and so on. <coughs> so it's really intuitive for the end user. And it's cost-aware approach. Um, when you when you build a farm, when you build a farm, or when you deploy a virtual machine, it gives you an idea of a cost, okay? Which is not really used by the customer, who, but want to give the idea of the end customer how much would that cost in the internal IT. So it give you try to spend wisely your budget. That's the message, okay? And. One other really good thing is uh, two-factor authentication. So this web portal is also exposed to the internet for selected uh, suppliers and selected partners and consultants as well. So they want to have secure access and a role-based access control as well. But there is a cons. Uh, compared to cloud forms and uh, CSA, uh, Scala does not support VMware directly. It does support VMware VIO uh, through VIO. We, VIO is VMware integrated OpenStack. So you have to use the OpenStack API to access the platform, which in this case is okay because we, they decided to go for uh, OpenStack under, uh, VMware under OpenStack. Uh, short screenshot, can you see here? Um, you got something already predefined. You can create your own. You can create your own platform and your own um, Basically, your own roles. Uh, really depends, of course, on what you want to achieve. But uh, they want to get rid of a common request. Uh, can I have a JBoss? Uh, or can I have a um, LAMP? Or can I have a MySQL? Well, point and click, and that's it. You know? But we are ready to go into production. And uh, one, I guess one week before. The CIO come back and says, oh, by the way, we renewed our contract with Microsoft. And they gave us something like 150 pounds free for Azure services instead of a discount. And now we have to use it. Oh, shit. <laughs> 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 
So <laughs> the good thing, I mean, uh, that was really bad news uh, one week to go in production, but luckily um, this specific cloud management platform supports Azure. So we ended up with this, Scala, uh, to talk on one side to OpenStack and the other side to Azure to deploy, well, uh, in that specific case was <laughs> deploying uh, front-end services to the um, suppliers and to consultants. So they moved, so we deployed the portals. We got some, a couple of really big portals from the outside to Azure to, to leverage the bandwidth Azure has. Uh, 10 minutes, okay, thanks. I'll try to be quick. Um, uh, so you ended up with both. Um, Scala is able to pick up images from everywhere. So I don't think with 10 minutes I will, I will have time for a demo, but if you want to have a quick look, it's on my laptop. I can show you on breaks or whatever, or maybe later. Um, but once it, the problem, we solved the deployment of change management and uh, provisioning, initial provisioning, but how do you manage you know, the standard everyday job? Um, uh, you can select several different options for automation. Uh, this, every, everything is good. I mean, Puppet, uh, I think you heard the name, Puppet, uh, Chef, uh, Salt, but we decided to go for Ansible. Uh, for me, it's a bit simple. There are pros and cons in each solution. Uh, feel free to ask if you uh, want to see to hear my opinion, but the, the message is uh, internally they are used to create the, what they call standard builds, which means uh, an operating system with a different kind of uh, installed applications and uh, configuration, especially uh, for security reason, they have uh, um, internal security guides for each operating system. So it, what they did up to before I came in is just manually deploy a VM and then manually configure each VM, which is pretty much impossible, especially if you have something like 2,000 virtual machines. Um, but we decided to go for Ansible for specializing, and we'll see you in a few, but also for compliance reason. Uh, they use CentOS and RHEL, they got some Ubuntu, and they got Windows as well, Windows 2008 and Windows 2012. So uh, bear with me, I'm not really a Windows expert, <laughs> but if you have any questions around, I can maybe be able to ask, uh, to, to answer. Um, what are the rules? So this is the standard, their standard profile on, on Ansible. So first of all, they connect to Red Hat Satellite for patch management on the Linux boxes, so they can really roll out uh, new security patches when it's needed. Um, if you can recall, there was some security concerns uh, a few months um, ago about, for example, SSL and Open, uh, OpenSSH. Uh, so we decided for the core programs to ensure that the latest programs are installed into the system. Uh, install the monitoring agent, install the backup agent, it's HP, or OpenView, and Tivoli. And uh, install, I will show you what's a secure pass for uh, SSH helper and NSS plugin. So it's all about identity management and SSH key distribution. Uh, and as I told you before, there's, uh, they have these specific rules about hardening uh, a virtual machine, so all the hardening have been automatically applied. But the thing is, it's not just for the first time, but it's every now and then. So th we decided to go for a one or two week schedule. So there is um, an Ansible worker. So Compared to other solutions, Ansible is agentless and it's uh, serverless. So you need to have, if you want to automate, you have to have a dedicated server. Uh, by the time we decided to go for an um, internal solution based on Cron, okay. Uh, nowadays there is a, a product from Red Hat called uh, uh, Ansible Tower. It really depends on you, but the, the, the point is uh, this worker here is going to apply the standard profile for all the VMs in VMware, OpenStack, and Azure, ensuring that the programs are installed in the proper way and the compliance is set. So if anybody is mess messed up with the configuration, the configuration is restored, 
or being back to the security policy it used to be because sometimes programmers just oh there is there is a firewall in between oh let's disable the firewall and then mm, it's always either the firewall or AC Linux so it's <laughs> going to disable it anyway and on the other one they got satellite for patching uh, the system once they uh, um, once they need it. So, about just uh, one question about the uh, um, one topic about the um, identity management. So, if you use, uh, how many of you use Active Directory? More? Oh, well, surprisingly few. Lucky you. <laughs> okay. So, um, Active Directory is well uh, used into the IT. Um, but the problem with Active Directory is that unless you change the schema on Active Directory, you wouldn't be able to leverage some, uh, uh, some specific things on Linux. Linux can join Active Directory, but you cannot ensure you the same IDs all across the, um, uh, all across the Linux server. So you have to have something is able to end link all the IDs and all the SSH keys as well. So what we do is that we sync from Active Directory to SecurePass, and uh, SecurePass is an identity cloud identity management solution, can be on on cloud or on premise. You sync from Active Directory into your uh, domain in SecurePass, and then you add additional information such as Unix IDs and SSH keys. And when you log into a Linux server, what it does, it requests the SSH key to, to SecurePass, it identifies the, the user, and then it got the user that is, in this specific case, the group membership and session request to Active Directory. Okay, the SecurePass itself is able to, uh, to handle uh, groups as well, but in this specific case, Active Directory was the main source of group membership. And SecurePass, which is not used here, is also able to do uh, multi-factor authentication as well. Out of the box. So uh, just uh, SecurePass, it's a product from Garl, okay, the other company. Um, uh, SecurePass is actually upstream in Debian and Ubuntu, and it got repository and certified, we are certified ISV for Red Hat and CentOS and SUSE as well. So if you do, uh, if you have Ubuntu, you can do apt cache search, uh, secure pass, and it's already there. So it's upstream. And uh, the integration, as I said, a plugin for, uh, for Palm, if you're a techie, um, and then can do uh, authentication and authorization in your Linux. And there is a SSH helper for OpenSSH to pull OpenSSH keys from the server. So what's next? Um, so I left the, the, the customer uh, with, this with this scenario, and uh, this seems to like OpenStack. So uh, they want to create a multi-region architecture, multi-data center. So what you've seen before, there were two regions in OpenStack, one dedicated to VMware and one dedicated to KVM, but still in the same data center. The problem is they want to have a disaster <coughs> recovery and they're going to open another region in another data center. So the good thing about OpenStack is that if you architect it in the proper way, you got automatic disaster recovery and business continuity from it. So um, how, the, how does that work is that the, uh, there is a specific storage called object storage uh, achieved by Swift. And if you snapshot uh, one virtual machine on one data center, uh, it's automatically copied in all data centers. So you can actually restore the virtual machine anywhere. You can also achieve uh, active active, but it's a bit more complex. Um, you can choose, as I mentioned before, uh, an open stack, any storage you like. Um, um, my personal preference is to use Ceph, which is a software defined storage. Um, anyway, you can use any storage, and this specific case one does NetApp. Uh, NetApp is pretty much popular among my customers. Uh, everybody has a sort of spare one, so they want to use it. <laughs> oh, I got this, this great investment. I need to reuse it, okay. Well, it's not that bad, okay. Um, um, OpenStack can you also use uh, uh, fiber channel storage as well. But 
Again, my personal opinion, my personal preference is on software defined storage. Just a quick one. Um, in your bags, there was a, uh, a book. Um, it gives you an idea if you don't know anything about OpenStack, what OpenStack is and how it's composed. And uh, the, book, the book was meant to raise some uh, money for the kids in Africa. So you got it for free, but if you feel you want to do it, please donate to any charity of your, uh, you like. Any question? So I've got one couple of minutes left. So either, either you're shy or you're still sleeping. I guess it's the second one. It was just really, everybody knows now what it means. <laughs> so they all go to OpenStack now. I hope so. <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, it's in a past, uh, I wouldn't say you are forced to do because you are not forced to embrace OpenStack. But this is something, I mean, it's, it's like Linux on 96 or 97. So you will uh, probably end up going <coughs> in that path. So OpenStack is becoming really large. Okay, there are some core projects. Uh, it will uh, have a sort of container management tool. Uh, oh, yeah. <coughs> so um, really select carefully which project you want to embrace. So Linux in 96 and 97 was rock hard. Does that mean OpenStack is rock hard? Uh, OpenStack at the beginning was really rock hard. Now, I mean. No, no, no. Now is not that rock hard, but still you need to understand what you're doing. It's like, let's say it's like Linux five years ago. Okay, uh, it's still command line. Uh, you still have to understand what's. I mean, nowadays everybody can install Linux, but. Knowing what you're doing, it's another story. Okay, same with OpenStack. Uh, I've seen uh, OpenStack. So, still today, I'm seeing a lot of installation of OpenStack doing sort of next, 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 like in Windows, and then complaining about, oh, this is shit and scrap, it's bad performance. Um, uh, even big customers, okay, uh, it's not really bad performance. It's real bad design. It's okay if you want to, for example, if you want to have a single node. Installation to try is really easy, but you know. Do you do you have any customers that have tried implementing it and backed out? Yeah, especially a few years ago. Um, nowadays, there's more knowledge about OpenStack. So I started in OpenStack in uh, uh, 2010 uh, when I was in Canonical in Ubuntu. So really, the early stage, and then they moved to OpenStack, but and then they went back to VMware. The reason why um, were not a problem of bugs rather than a problem of culture because they're still thinking about, oh, it's OpenStack is a replacement of VMware. No, it is not. I mean, if you're trying to use OpenStack uh, like VMware, nowadays you can, but it was not meant to be an open, a VMware replacement. It's meant to be a common way of, accepting, uh, of accessing uh, corporate resources and a way of uh, consuming resources. 